How can we tell that the Gospels are trustworthy? One way is by fact-checking them against details of their contemporary history. If the Gospel writers make incidental references to historical facts that we can test, it would show that the evangelists knew their setting, and it would also show their truthfulness in reporting matters of detail. A very stark example of this is the case of John the Baptist. We get some interesting pieces of corroborating evidence about John from the Jewish historian Josephus. Let's first take a look at the Gospels. Besides being the Messiah's forerunner, John's famously known for baptizing people as a sign of repentance. Like most Old Testament prophets, John warned people of judgment if they didn't get their act together. Luke gives us a taste of one of his sermons. It reads, And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or make false accusation, and be content with your wages. Let's pause for just a second and deal with a skeptical objection. Why does Luke describe these soldiers as men on active duty when Jesus' ministry was during peacetime? Josephus fills us in. Antipas was actually at war with his ex-father-in-law, Eratos IV, king of the Nabataeans. We'll talk more about this skirmish in a little bit, but this does explain why Herod's soldiers would have come down from the Jordan Valley to get to the fort at the corner of the Dead Sea right by the contested border. While John was a popular guy, that didn't stop Herod Antipas from arresting and decapitating him. Mark's Gospel gives us the rundown. He writes, But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Rhodius, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, let's compare that to Josephus' account. Josephus writes, Now it seemed to some of the Jews that the destruction of Herod's army was by God and was certainly well deserved on the account of what he did to John called the Baptist. For Herod had executed him, though he was a good man, and had urged the Jews, if inclined to exercise virtue, to practice justice towards one another and piety towards God, to join in baptism. For baptizing was acceptable to him, not for the pardon of whatever sins they had committed, but in purifying the body, as though the soul had beforehand been cleansed in righteousness. And when others gathered, for they were greatly moved by his words, Herod, fearing that John's great influence over the people might result in some form of insurrection, for it seemed that they did everything by his counsel, thought it much better to put him to death before his work led to an uprising, than to await a disturbance, become involved in a problem, and have second thoughts. So the prisoner, because of Herod's suspicion, was sent to Machaerus, the stronghold previously mentioned, and there was executed. But to the Jews, it seemed vindication of John that God willed to do Herod an evil in the destruction of the army. So Mark tells us that because John condemned his marriage to his brother's wife, that he was arrested, while Josephus tells us that it was fear over an uprising. At first glance, this might seem like a bit of a contradiction, and how exactly would the Gospel writers know Herod's motives? In a completely unrelated passage, Luke's Gospel incidentally fills us in. Speaking of a list of Jesus' supporters he mentions in Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager, that's Luke 8.3. Ah, so these two bits of information actually fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. It's hard to think that Luke would have purposefully included this casual reference to Husa in a list completely disconnected in any way with Herod or John's beheading to explain this problem. This shows that the Gospel writers had some inside information, and John pointing out Herod's crime certainly could have sparked an uprising. Speaking of pieces fitting together, in Mark 6.27 we saw that Herod Antipas sent a military officer to execute John the Baptist. Some critics have asked why he didn't send a civil executioner as per the normal procedure, but Josephus tells us that he was at Machaerus on a military campaign and not at home, so this actually makes a lot of sense. Josephus also tells us about Herod's illegitimate marriage. He writes, But Herodias, their sister, was married to Herod Philip and the son of Herod the Great, the child of Marame, daughter of Simon the high priest, and to them was born Salome. After her birth, Herodias, thinking to violate the ways of the fathers, abandoned a living husband and married Herod Antipas, who was the tetrarch of Galilee, her husband's brother by the same father. So Mark tells us that Herodias had a daughter and Josephus actually supplies her name, Salome. There's also some further relevance here. Skeptics have tried to say that Mark was a clueless Gentile who put words in the mouth of Jesus. Here's one critic. In Mark 10, 11 through 12, Jesus forbids divorce. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Verse 12 implies that Mark believed women had a right to divorce in Jewish law. They did not. 
Now, this skeptic is referring to Deuteronomy 24, which allows a Jewish man to divorce his wife, but not the other way around. But let's look at the context and see where Jesus was teaching. It says in Mark 10, Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Ah, this would be Perea smack dab in the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. Mark tells us the divorce question was a test from the Pharisees. The Net Bible Commentary gives us a little background as to how exactly they were testing him. They write, It is likely that the Pharisees were hoping that he might answer the question of divorce in a way similar to John the Baptist and so suffer the same fate as John, i.e. death at the hands of Herod. So the Pharisees were hoping that Jesus would come out strongly against Herod and get himself into some hot water. Herod was already paranoid over Jesus as he thought he was John the Baptist raised from the dead and that was the source of his miraculous powers. Again, this window into Herod's thoughts would have came from Husa. But Jesus, being unafraid to die, didn't back down. He boldly said, fully knowing of the situation around him, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. His audience would have definitely picked up what he was laying down. Jesus was throwing down the gauntlet. So no, Mark wasn't culturally ignorant. In summary, notice how much Josephus corroborates what the Gospels say about John the Baptist. Josephus says John inclined the Jews to exercise virtue and practice justice towards one another, and the Gospels say that John taught people to be generous, to not extort, or make false accusations. Josephus says John baptized many Jews as a sign of repentance, and the Gospels say the exact same thing. Josephus says that Herod arrested John the Baptist. Likewise, the Gospels say the same thing. Josephus tells us that Herodias left Philip and married his brother Herod Antipas. The Gospels report that Herod divorced his wife and married his brother Philip's wife Herodias. Josephus tells us that Herod had John the Baptist executed and the Gospels say that he was beheaded. So the corroboration among Josephus and the Gospels regarding John the Baptist and the whole marriage debacle between Herod and Herodias should increase our trust in the Gospels. If the evangelists got John's story straight, how much more would they be careful with the narrative of the one who is at the very center of the story?